It analysed data from advice calls made by senior rights Victoria advocates and lawyers over a seven year period from the 1st of July 2012 to the 30th of June 2019. It's a report that is rich in detail that tells us who old abuse affects, the factors that heighten abuse are occurring and who's responsible for the abuse experienced by those who come to our service. Since our commencement in 2008, we've received well over 28,000 calls to our statewide helpline. And from these calls, people who want our assistance and meet our service criteria, go through an intake to receive an advice service. At this point, more detailed information is gathered from the person, and it's the data from these advice services that informed the report. In the seven year period, we had 2,380 advice services related to a form of elder abuse. And just a reminder that these numbers come from a very, very limited car, um, case staff team with an average of uh, two to three lawyers a year and two to three advocates a year. However, the numbers are significant for us to draw some conclusions. This seven year report looked at what remained consistent over time and what changed over, over time. And it's an important addition to the growing evidence around elder abuse and we need lots more evidence to inform us. So I encourage you all in terms of gathering that. Over the years, there's been a consistency in the percentage of older people abused by a family member, just over 90%, and over 80% by a younger family member, um, evidencing the role of abuse between generations within the families. Um, and the other thing that was consistent was the gender of older people, 72% female and 28% male. So there's a significant proportion of males, but there is still an overrepresentation of females compared to the general population of older people. This, this is, demonstrates the intersection of gender upon ageism. The changes that we picked up over the, the seven years uh, were that there was an increase in the proportion of female perpetrators, so 54% male and 46% female, and that there was an increase in the reports of perpetrators experiencing mental health uh, issues and alcohol and other drug issues and gambling problems. And these are reports by the older people who are the victims of what they say is happening. Um, just a reminder that uh, this data is pre-COVID time, can we remember back then? But during, during the COVID-19 pandemic, people are experiencing uh, increased stress and difficulties and can become more reliant on aging parents for housing and financial support. And also have, have an increase in mental health and substance use problems. This might lead to an increased risk of elder abuse, but we need to better address the issues of perpetrators so we can help stop elder abuse occurring. And a reminder, when we think about elder abuse, there are risk factors which include the characteristics of the older person, the perpetrator, the nature of the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator, and the characteristics of the social environment that are reliably associated with elder abuse. And environmental risk factors include social isolation, uh, a lack of uh, social support, uh, which of course is uh, experience, being experienced strongly at present, but these are also experienced more by older people because they're connected with the age structures we have in our community about how we engage with older people. Enough from me. I'd now like to welcome Luke Grant, who's the Relationship Manager of State Trustees Australia Foundation, to say a few words. Thanks, Luke. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, good morning. I'm Luke Wright um, from State Trustees, representing State Trustees Australia Foundation. I also uh, would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the lands from which we're all joining this launch and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. The helpline provided by Seniors Rights Victoria is an important service and the report shows how critical it is given that there's been a 63% increase in the last seven years. The insights from the analysis of this data have highlighted the experiences of older persons and you know, those who use this to, uh, to seek help when experiencing abuse. We are immensely pleased the foundation funded the project, which represents a partnership between the thought leaders in the area this area of interest, um, namely NARI and Seniors Rights Victoria. Since 2016, State Trustees Australia Foundation 
has provided over $400,000 worth of funding to address elder abuse. This is possible due to the generosity of individuals, families and companies that have either made a donation or a bequest in their will. Uh, these gifts have allowed for the foundation to distribute almost $29 million to charitable organisations over the last 25 years. As the public trustee of Victoria, State Trustees is committed to protecting the rights and finances of Victorians. Every year, unfortunately, we discover instances where older people have been taken advantage of financially and often by those they trust the most. Preventing elder abuse is crucial to support older Victorians age well. Thank you to Seniors Rights Victoria and NARI for their excellent work. And I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, and we are we're very appreciative of the support of our state trustees over the years from the, the first report we did our data in 2012-2014 and now the seven year report and uh, really pleased that you're interested in uh, that state trustees is interested in putting money into research. Um, I'd now like to um, welcome um, the Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence, the Honourable Gabrielle Williams. Minister Williams is also the Minister for Women and the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs in the Victorian Government. She was appointed to the Cabinet in 2018, having previously served as a Parliamentary Secretary and proudly represents her local community as a member of Dandenong. Previously, Minister Williams worked as an advisor in both state and federal government and served as a director of a not-for-profit disability support organisation. Thank you, Minister Williams. Thanks, Jenny, and thank you all for allowing me to, to take part in, in such a wonderful occasion today. Before I begin, though, please let me acknowledge the traditional owners and the land in which we're all gathered, acknowledging, of course, that we're all gathered on, on different country here today, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and any other elders we may have here with us today. I also, though, want to acknowledge uh, all victim survivors of family violence, which, of course, includes elder abuse that might be here today. And those who are not here because of it, and those um, who live with the trauma um, of that abuse day in and day out, and we should never um, lose sight of that. I also want to acknowledge, of course, the many representatives that we have here today, and we've got an incredible panel, uh, but also representatives from COTA, from NARI, and of course, from the State Trustees Australia Foundation, who we've just heard from uh, Luke. Um, it's a wonderful partnership, this project, and uh, my observation is always that um, these sorts of partnerships bring uh, the best results with them and the, and the um, best development of understanding uh, by, by bringing different, different parts of our system and, and expertise together. So well done on that. I also uh, want to acknowledge that many watching this webinar today will be dedicating your working lives or perhaps even your personal lives to preventing and responding to elder abuse. Uh, and I want to thank you for that work. Um, and also acknowledge the fact that at the moment that work is being done in particularly challenging and unprecedented times uh, and that deserves I think recognition. Um, we're all sort of learning as we go at the moment and I'm very uh, aware that in our service system in particular in particular and all aspects of it uh, we're all having to work differently, we're all having to um, uh, be a little bit more innovative with how we respond to problems at a time where those problems are sometimes presenting in different ways too and with added complexity. So, so thank you. Um, Jenny alluded uh, to the fact too that at this point in time, you know, so far we've got indications um, that there's a greater risk of family violence um, during the pandemic period and we expect that there will be um, during the pandemic as well. And elder abuse, of course, we expect will be a feature of that. So we are in um, for some challenging times ahead and uh, I think that makes this work particularly um, timely and I'll say a little bit more about the work um, shortly. But uh, you may have noticed I've already framed uh, elder abuse in the context of family violence, which is re uh, really something that's only um, began to happen in the mainstream since the Royal Commission into Family Violence, where we've uh, began to see elder abuse through that frame. And I think that's an important development for a couple of reasons, but one of which is that um, in my view and in my experience so far, it's raised the profile of elder abuse, particularly um, in and around policymakers and changed the way 
way we talk about it and conceive of it and, and therefore the way that we seek to understand it um, as well, which I think is an incredibly important development for us to be able to continue to make um, inroads and improvements um, in this area of people's lives. It really is our collective responsibility to take action to address this issue, um, to not only better respond to situations of elder abuse, but to, of course, um, prevent it from happening in the first in the first place. And improving our understanding of it really is at the foundation of, of that. And when I say our, I say that as a, as a member of parliament and government, but of course, I also mean the community's understanding of the issue as well. Um, if, we, if we don't recognise it, we can't then work to prevent it. So the, any work that helps the community and all of us as policymakers better recognise, better understand, and therefore better understand what levers are available to us to respond um, is incredibly critical for us to be able to achieve um, change, which is why I'm really um, thrilled to be able to be here uh, for the launch of, of the Seniors Rights Victoria and the NARA Institute's Seven Years of Elder Abuse Data in Victoria report. Um, as I said, it strengthens our understanding of elder abuse here in Victoria. It provides really important insights around the type of elder abuse that's being experienced, but also who it's happening to and who it's responsible for it, as Jenny um, uh, really uh, interestingly outlined um, in her opening remarks. And of course, for me also as a Minister for Women, it's, all, it's always really interesting to observe that um, at all ends of that uh, family violence spectrum, women do uh, tend to be disproportionately the victims of family violence. And that's a really important, um, a really important that we recognise that and recognise the gendered lens that, of, that often um, sits over these sorts of issues as well, uh, because it's a very complex web and ties into many other um, policy areas and areas that we need to be responding to across our community. So I'd like to congratulate um, Seniors Rights Victoria, NARI, and of course, um, the State Trustees Australia Foundation uh, for this partnership, for your hard work and commitment to preventing uh, elder abuse, but also to building the evidence base that will effectively lead to us being able to do that. And to acknowledge, of course, the older people who have sought help uh, and also those who have shared their stories uh, so that we might have this better understanding. It's an incredibly brave thing to do, um, both fronts, to both reach out for help when you need it, but also to share your story uh, for, the, for the benefit of others in the hope that uh, what you've been through um, doesn't um, have to be experienced by someone else. And uh, we, uh, it's really important to me that we um, take the, the time to appreciate the bravery that's involved in that, but also to appreciate that sometimes that comes at great personal cost for people um, in sharing their stories. And um, so please thank you um, uh, to those who have done that and to those who have fed into this report in even the smallest of, of ways. Um, so we're eternally grateful for, the, for this work and for all of your commitment. We're eternally grateful um, for the commitment, the commitment that is increasingly arising in different sections of our service system and community uh, in terms of focus on elder abuse and this issue and the willingness um, and enthusiasm about learning more about it. It is only through us um, opening our minds and uh, committing to a better understanding that we will achieve change. And of course, by working in partnership uh, in terms of organisationally, but also working in partnership with older people themselves. So uh, for everyone that is here today, I hope um, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, thank you for your commitment and thank you for letting me uh, be involved in, in such a, a, a wonderful development. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, I really appreciate your support um, for us. And I know that I've had, um, you've come to other things that we've put on and I really appreciate that. And I think that um, your passion for family violence and elder abuse is so evident and it's, it's great that we've got that in the Minister. And I note the comment you talked about the bravery of people in dealing with their issues. Um, I've just been asked to start my video. I thought I had it on, sorry. Um, the, the bravery of people with dealing with these issues. And we know that we have people who it's incredibly hard for them to do this. And we also know that from people who have spoken to us when we've talked to them about the outcomes, our older people, they've said the message they would give to other older people is start earlier, get help earlier. Um, so that's a really significant um, learning, I think, for us to try and intervene much earlier and have help for people. Um, 
Thank you again, Minister. I'd now like to welcome and introduce Jared Mansour, who's the Commissioner for Senior Victorians and the Ambassador for Elder Abuse Prevention, who will chair the panel discussion. Um, Jared is a highly respected and passionate advocate for the needs of older people. And with over 30 years of leadership experience within the aged care and community services sector. Um, Jared has worked, uh, contributed significantly to industry capacity building and policy development and the enhancement of services for older Australians. In 2012, Jared became the inaugural national CEO of Leading Age Services Australia, the peak national body representing the aged and community care industry across Australia. Prior to this, um, Jared was the CEO of Aged and Community Care Victoria for six years. Welcome, Jared, and I hand over to you. Thanks very much, Jenny, and, and thank you for that fantastic presentation to Minister. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, the many lands that we're meeting on today in the, often the comfort of our, of our own homes or offices and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our wonderful panel today. Um, firstly, Rebecca Edwards. So Rebecca has a passion for social justice. She began her career as a practicing lawyer working in private practice in rural and regional Victoria in um, Victoria Legal Aid and for the UNICTR in Tanzania and for the Kimberley Land Council. Rebecca then spent 10 years teaching the next generation of lawyers as a lecturer at La Trobe University, teaching subjects with a focus on social justice. Returning to the practice of law in 2017, Rebecca was appointed Principal Lawyer at Seniors Rights Victoria. In her spare time, she runs a small farm with a husband and two sons growing ethically raised pastured pigs in Central Victoria. Um, what a great place to be now, Central Victoria, by the way. Bryony Dow. Bryony Dow is Director of the National Ageing Research Institute, NARI, an Honorary Professor at the School of Population and Global Health, University of Melbourne, an Honorary Professor, School of Nursing and Midwifery, Deakin University. At NARI, Bryony oversees a range of aged care, social and clinical gerontology research programs, including her own research into elder abuse and carer mental health. She is a past president and life member of the Australian Association of Gerontology, and she is on a range of national advisory groups, including the AIHW Age Care Data Advisory Group and Elder Abuse Action Australia Advisory Committee. Welcome, Bryony. Dr. Megan O'Brien is Head of Social Work, Interpreting Services and Spiritual Care at Peninsula Health. She currently has operational responsibility for three Victorian government funded projects relating to family violence across the lifespan. Peninsula Health is one of the trial, five trial integrated model of care uh, elder abuse sites in Victoria, embedding a model of care for responding to suspected elder abuse. In addition to this, Peninsula Health is also working with the Victoria Police to support older people through the implementation of an elder abuse financial trial. Megan completed her PhD in elder abuse at the University of Melbourne and findings from this research have contributed to the broader elder abuse evidence base and policy context. Welcome, Megan. And Eleanor Campbell is a lawyer, speechwriter and former political staffer who's worked in legal and social policy for over 20 years. As Associate Director at the Centre for Innovative Justice, Eleanor leads research focusing on interventions with perpetrators of family violence helping courts and government departments implement recommendations from Victoria's Royal Commission into Family Violence and driving multi-jurisdictional ANROS funded projects. Welcome panel members. And um, Rebecca, we're gonna bat off with you. So the data from this report comes from what is called advice calls, which is a service provided by Seniors Rights Victoria's lawyers and advocates. Can you please briefly explain the process of how a client engages with Seniors Rights Victoria and what happens in an advice call? Sure. So Seniors Rights has a helpline, which is the way most people initially engage with Seniors Rights. It runs from 10 till 5 and it's, uh, the, it's answered by our advocates, so our non-legal social workers and our family violence workers. About one third of the calls are from older people themselves. Uh, another third are from concerned others and a third from professionals. If the call's from an older person themselves, then 
the advocates will talk to them about the issue and provided it's seen as an elder abuse issue, they're booked in for a telephone appointment. Because Seniors Rights is a fully integrated service where the lawyers and the non-legal advocates work together, all the appointments are with both a lawyer and with a social worker. Uh, then at the moment, they're all being done by telephone. Prior to the COVID lockdowns, we had probably about 70% were done by telephone and the rest were done by home visits. The issues that people were facing are family violence related, helping remove older people from, oh, sorry, adult children from an older person's home, all the different types of financial abuse. So it can be debts and loans, breaches of powers of attorney, money missing from bank accounts, uh, forcible transfers of property. There's all sorts of property disputes, so co-ownership disputes, granny flat interests, assets for care, and a little bit of guardianship and administration and grandparenting type cases. Thanks very much. Um, so in that context, um, an opportunity for me to just sort of outline how the rest of our panel is going to work from now on. So on the webinar, you'll see that there's a, a Q&A box where at any point you can put the questions that you might like the panel to ask. And in the background, I've very kindly got a, a good prompt from Melanie, who's going to keep bringing questions to my attention from time to time. So we'll go through a whole series of structured questions that I've worked out for each of the panelists. But at a few points um, over the next 40 minutes, we will go to, um, to questions from yourselves. So please, as we go along, feel free to use the Q&A um, little um, question box at any time. In addition to that, we'll have a time at the end of the panel where we'll literally focus on each of the questions and I'll, I'll take the questions. And so if you've got a question to a particular panelist, please um, note that in, in the question as you go. So that's sort of a rough idea of the structure. Feel free to ask um, questions as we go and we'll come to those both during the, the panel discussion and um, at the end. So Bryony, over to yourself. So in your working life, Bryony, you deal a lot with data and information um, and most importantly, interpreting it and, and getting a sense of what it means. So can you give us some insight into what the data tells us and what the data that's been collected in this report? Sure, thanks, Jared, and good morning, everyone. So the data is for a seven year period, as uh, Jenny's already outlined. So we've calculated both averages over time, but also we were really interested in trends over time. So it's been organized into two, also two, two year periods. So 2012-14 and 2018-19. And what we've learnt is that uh, the, there's been a substantial increase firstly into um, people seeking assistance um, from Seniors Lights Victoria, particularly these advice calls, as Rebecca's just explained. And this peaked actually, interestingly, after the uh, Royal Commission into Family Violence in Victoria. So around 2016-17, that was in 2015, there was a peak. So obviously greater awareness has led to, a, to more people contacting Seniors Rights Victoria. What it includes is information about the older person. So we know that the largest group of people approaching uh, Seniors Rights Victoria are in their 70s, um, followed by people in their 80s and in their 60s. And there's some different characteristics between those groups, um, particularly in terms of uh, cultural diversity. So almost half of the sample were born uh, 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 not in Australia, in a country other than Australia, and the most is obviously England. But the, the older group are more likely to come from Greek, uh, Greece and Italy, so reflecting post-war migration, post migration patterns. Um, and the younger group are more likely to come from Vietnam or China or New Zealand. So they also, uh, uh, we also get uh, information about what they're seeking advice for. And about two thirds or just over 60% are seeking advice for psychological abuse. So that's things like verbal abuse and threats and bullying and controlling behavior. And about an equal number are seeking help for financial abuse, some of which Rebecca's already outlined. So things like incurring bills for which the older person's responsible, abuse of powers of attorney, 
uh, being asked to be loan guarantors, that, those sorts of things that are financially disadvantaged for the older, disadvantageous for the older person. And about a quarter are experiencing more than one type of abuse. We've also collected, also there's a lot of data about the perpetrator, which I think we might cover a bit later, but just still focusing on the older person. Um, we found that, uh, oh, that it's mostly women, that's already been covered, that there were 72% of the callers were women, and um, that uh, mostly they're low income, so mostly they're pensioners. Um, so, there's a lot of data in this report, it's very rich, um, and I encourage you all to look at it in more depth, but that's a brief overview of the sorts of things that you'll find. Thanks very much, Bryony. Does the data give us any insights into the whole issue of prevalence? We know that's that's been a significant topic and a focus of you know the national, the Commonwealth government looking at the issue of prevalence. So does this give us any insights um, at all, Bryony, into, into the prevalence question? Yeah, I think we need to be careful about what this data does tell us. So it tells us about the characteristics of people who've approached Seniors Rights Victoria, but it's not a population representative sample of, of older people and people in the general community experiencing elder abuse, which is what a prevalence study is. The good news is there is a prevalence study currently underway being conducted by the Australian Institute of Family Studies, and that's funded by the Attorney General's Department. So that will give us some insight into prevalence. I say some insight because most of these prevalence studies are still an underestimate because people are reluctant to disclose elder abuse. Um, but what that study will tell us is not only something about prevalence in Victoria, but about every other state and territory. And the other thing that it's done is ask similar questions to the questions that are being asked in England, Ireland, uh, Canada, and other countries that have conducted similar studies. So we'll have some international comparisons. And I'm hoping that we'll get the findings from that study shortly. I know it's very much uh, underway. Thanks very much, Brian. Is, is part of your concern then, uh, notwithstanding all the data and knowledge we've got, that there's still potentially a gap that a number of older people aren't yet taking action? Is that one of the things that would be on your mind? Yeah, absolutely. I think that what we see is the tip of the iceberg. I think um, particularly when you look at the types of abuse, there's not a lot of neglect reported. There's not a lot of so uh, sexual abuse reported. Some of these things, I think, are still very much going under the radar. Um, you, you would need, it's just very difficult for the older person themselves to be empowered to report something like neglect. And there's such stigma around sexual abuse that I think that we, we're just not seeing uh, anywhere near the prevalence of those issues in, the, in these data, but, but probably we won't see it uh, sufficiently even when we do the prevalence study. Thanks very much, Bryony. And over to you, Megan. Megan, you're in a, a fairly unique situation. Um, in, in your, you know, if you look at the work of Peninsula Health, it's part of um, not only the, the direct work that, that you do, it's part of the Victoria's, um, one of Victoria's five trial sites for the integrated model of care. And was also working with Victoria Police in the elder abuse financial trial. So um, Peninsula Health touches a number of really important projects. In your role at Peninsula Health, Megan, you're head of um, social work of a busy health service. How often do your staff encounter patients who've experienced elder abuse? And can you describe some of the situations that might present? Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Jared, and good morning to everyone. And just before I'd start, I'd like to um, acknowledge our local traditional owners here, um, the Buddharong and the Buddharong people of the Kulin Nations. And congratulations to Jenny and all those who have contributed to this report um, and the opportunity to be part of this panel. We're certainly in a very interesting situation here on the um, Frankston Mornington Peninsula because we have um, some of the most socially disadvantaged people living in our region and we also have such significantly high rates of older people. Um, I think and unfortunately, we do see significant forms of all family violence, including elder abuse. And our region has the highest police call out rates per capita for family violence in Metro Melbourne, which is pretty significant. Um, certainly when I looked at this report and looked at the data, I thought it might be helpful just to compare some of the data we see within our health service compared to perhaps some of those calls to SRV. We've certainly looked at our data across social work inpatient wards across four sites and also our ED presentation data, both at Frankston and Rosebud. 
And the data, unfortunately, from the 1st of January this year until August 2020, in relation to family violence, we had an increase of 88% of presentations. Um, and when we actually broke that down to um, elder abuse for that same time period compared to last year, we've had an increase in 59%. So that's pretty telling in terms of what we're actually seeing um, in our hospital. And unfortunately, the referrals coming through are a much higher risk rating really compared to pre-COVID situations. So we're seeing significant situations where there's stalking, sexual assault, and we have seen that with older people, headbutting, trauma, and even strangulation, and that includes older people as well. Um, and again, just the data that we're certainly seeing in our health service compared to perhaps what's been presented in the seven year report for SRV. I think we've already touched on that, but some of the comparisons are of that data, we've seen 44% um, for our hospital data relates to physical abuse and 17% of that data um, of our cohort actually represents neglect. So that's, I suppose, um, indicative of probably some of the really challenging situations we see within the health service. And I don't think our health service would be different to many other health services, knowing that a huge cohort or people that present or have um, links to their health service are older people. Um, and, you know, we've, we've touched on prevalence and I'm sure a big part of why that data is the way it is, because we do have, we've played such a significant role in teaching and training staff to recognise and respond to elder abuse. So that's probably, um, and, and the other thing I think which is quite unique to any health service, including our health service, is that we also have situations where the perpetrator can be our client or our patient ourselves. So that um, changes the dynamics and how we work with those, um, the, the perpetrator who might be our patient, um, and then how we support um, the victims or the older people um, or their carers in those situations. Thanks very much, Megan. Um, in the, in the, for much of this year, um, we've all had our lives impacted by COVID-19, haven't we, in so many, so many different ways. Has your work in relation to elder abuse been affected by the pandemic and the lockdown? And have you, does that give us any insights into the type of elder abuse situations that are happening and whether, whether there's been a change in the nature of reporting or the, the nature of abuse that's occurring? So any insights, Megan, in, in that? Yeah, whole again, these are probably just insights from what we've seen and just from the reporting that we've seen. But I mean, we, we all know what the, the, the risk, risk factors are for elder abuse, but I think we'd all probably agree that um, the, with the restrictions with COVID-19, Social isolation for older people has been significant um, with the financial stresses, um, anxiety, depression we've seen with older people presenting. Um, particularly, I think COVID-19 has impacted on old, older people who might have a um, previous trauma history, the dependence on family or caregivers, and even their um, multiple comorbidities. So some of the things I think we've always taken for granted in terms of the support networks or how we've um, responded to older people, even the fact that older people are not necessarily having face-to-face -face contact with their GP, so that might be a trusted person who they may previously have spoken to about their concerns. Even in a hospital, I think we, um, certainly in the work I've been doing, you often teach health professionals how to pick up signs or what are some of those triggers to look for elder abuse and the fact that hospitals haven't even had um, family members visiting or on site. So you can't see some of that subtlety around um, observing how an older person may engage with their family member, their son or daughter who might be visiting. And sometimes that's given social workers, for example, an opportunity to engage with an older person. You might say something like, oh, that's interesting how your son or daughter has spoken to you about that particular situation. Is that, is that something common that you would experience at home. So even some of those types of things, you can't have those conversations. We've had situations with the fact that grandparents have been doing homeschooling that's impacted on family dynamics in the home situation. So we've certainly seen cases where there's been physical abuse as a result of that heightened stress. Um, some of the protective factors that hospitals would normally support older people who might be experiencing elder abuse are unfortunately no longer there in terms of those wraparound services. Even the fact that ACAS, um, which is a, a service that really has a high responsibility in terms of supporting older people around assessments, are doing telehealth. Um, so there's, there's very few services that will actually go into the home to actually support older people. So even our training um, has all been remote. So even how we're training health professionals, 
um, reduction in carer supports, um, and even the referrals to our Orange Door or Specialist Family Violence Services have really decreased. Um, and we're, we're actually finding in our region that they're actually coming from a third party. So it might not be the, um, the older person or the other person experiencing family violence um, reporting. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think the true picture of really the impact on COVID and older people, I think we're really yet to see. But yeah, I think from my perspective, it's, it's quite significant um, in terms of some of, as I said, some of those protective factors um, are no longer there at the moment. Thanks, Megan. That certainly gives us some insights, doesn't it, into sort of the areas we might focus on as we're, we're you know, moving out of, um, in the, you know, uh, with a lot of hope, um, stage four in Melbourne and, and stage three in, in the other areas of Victoria. Um, Megan, I'd just like to, we've got a question from Barry Ranson that I'd just like you to comment on, and then I'll, I might ask Rebecca as well to, to make a comment. Is there a tendency for men not to report? So a particular question about men. So any insights, Megan, into that question? Um, well, again, I mean, all, all, any work that I've done, I mean, I think the, the data is consistent, um, certainly the SIV data, the data that we have within our health service, I certainly are confident, I know data about another large metropolitan hospital, and certainly I think it's fairly consistent that usually about 30% of data or older people are reporting are usually from male victims. So, um, and we're seeing that exact same thing. So I don't think that's that's um, inconsistent in any health services or what, what um, data or what older people are contacting SRB. Thanks, Megan. Rebecca, any insights you'd like to give us? Welcome. Um, Bryony might answer this in a more theoretical way, but we obviously get some pretty serious cases where uh, men are the ones experiencing the elder abuse, but the proportions are lower. But I don't know that we have evidence that shows that that's because they're underreporting, or whether it's because they're experiencing less abuse, and, and I've got no idea of the answer to that. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so, Bryony, um, I might um, see if you might like to make a comment on that, and then I've got, I've got a question where we're just going to focus for a little while on perpetrators. So, just to start, did um, any observations about um, tendency for men not to report? Um, yeah, as Rebecca says, it's very difficult to know whether that's because they're less likely to experience abuse or less likely to report it. I mean, I think reporting, as I've already talked about, is, is low overall. Um, but I guess um, the, some of the research that we've done with older men more generally about mental health issues is that they won't, they won't talk to anyone, they won't seek help from uh, health services, um, and that's because that, particularly in this older group, which was over 80, um, it just didn't accord with their own understanding of themselves as men, their own understanding of masculinity and being tough and stoic and not, not seeking help. So I think that would probably contribute, but and also possibly the same reasons that older women don't, if they feel that it's their somehow their responsibility when it's, you know, we know it's 90% family members or over 90% family members who are presenting, um, sorry, who are perpetrating the abuse. Um, people feel responsible for that. They've brought up this um, child who's now becoming abusive towards them and they, that's, that's a huge barrier to, um, to doing anything about it, um, which we found in our earlier qualitative study of um, Senior Rights Victoria clients. But getting back to this report and the, and the yeah. data and what it tells us. Um, so, I mean, consistent with the earlier report, um, over 90% of perpetrators are family members of the older person. And so that's a very significant finding in, an, in and of itself. Um, and that they're mostly adult sons uh, or adult daughters of the older person and to a lesser extent, um, other family members, daughters and sons-in-law, um, grand, grandchildren and so on. And I think this is one of the ways that um, elder abuse is unique in terms of the family violence spectrum in that it's, it's different from, whilst it is still gendered, it is somewhat different from uh, intimate, intimate partner violence because the intimate partner only accounts for less than 10% of the perpetrators um, in, this, in this group of people seeking help. So I think that's just something important to keep in mind. And what was interesting to us was that there were some hunches that Seniors Rights Victoria advocates had when we first started out 
um, that they asked us to explore and see whether they were borne out in the data. And one of them was that women were increasingly perpetrators. Um, and we did find that, that there's an increase of women, uh, a trend to an increase of women perpetrators over time. And that actually in one particular period, 12 month period, uh, women did reach over 50%, just over 50% of perpetrators. So this is an interesting trend. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just an interesting trend that um, we're seeing more women perpetrating elder abuse um, than, uh, you know, I guess compared to what we normally would see. And the other hunch they had, which has already been talked about, was that there were increasing uh, mental health, gambling, uh, substance abuse problems. And again, we saw this over the seven year period, um, that there was a significant increase, very significant increase in particularly in mental health problems, but also an increase in uh, gambling and substance abuse problems over time. So I guess um, what this tells me is just the importance of thinking about elder abuse much more broadly than just helping the older person, critically important as that is, that we're really looking at a much broader social issue. We're looking at, you know, we need services for mental health, we need um, help for gambling, we need help for people who are homeless and then forced to move back in with their parents, particularly uh, at the moment. Um, and hopefully uh, Ellen is going to touch on some of these issues, so I, I might stop there. Thanks very much, Bryony. Rebecca, um, one of the most common scenarios in the report was the, the question or the issue of an adult child perpetrating abuse against their, their ageing parents or their grandparents. Um, can you tell us what this looks like in reality and, and maybe give us a, a particular example? Thanks, Rebecca. Yep, I've chosen an example that has a bit of a, a COVID flavour to it, because I think that's appropriate. So we had clients, a husband and wife, they had a family home, their daughter was living with them, and she had diagnosed mental health issues. She had lived independently, but she'd moved back in with them about five years ago following a relationship breakdown. The daughter's unemployed, she sleeps all day and she's out all night. She returns home about 4.30 a.m. each morning. They don't know what she does. The daughter insists on the air conditioning being on a lot of the time. The parents are extremely cold, except in their bedroom where they've got a little blow heater. The daughter insists that they're quiet during the day while she's sleeping. She doesn't contribute to any of the housing costs. She doesn't buy any food. She yells and swears at her parents if they don't have what she considers the right food available for her in the cupboard. And when they've broached the idea of her moving out, she has responded with comments like they don't love her and she may as well just kill herself. The wife became ill and needed to move into an, an aged care facility. And the husband didn't want to stay at home with the daughter. So they were lucky enough to find a facility that had a double room that they could both go into. But the daughter um, kept messaging them and calling them at all hours of the day and night, putting pressure on them to come home. Uh, she was worried that the house might be sold for the aged care facility bond. She also began selling off a whole lot of their items that were in the house and keeping any money that she got from those items. And the wife became so ill that there was no chance that she could return home. But the husband's now stuck in an aged care facility with COVID cases in this shared room with his very unwell wife and basically unable to leave and getting harassed by his daughter. Thanks, Rebecca. That gives us a, a real insight. Eleanor, we'll bring you in now. Um, so in your research work at the Centre for Innovative Justice, you've been involved with a few different research projects to do with perpetrators of family violence. Both men who perpetrate intimate partner violence and adolescents who are violent towards family members. Because we're talking about adult perpetrators um, in, in you know, many of the examples, what kind of programs are out there? Oh, thanks, Jared, and thanks everyone for having me involved today. Um, I think that uh, Minister Williams, uh, in her opening remarks, really um, summed up the challenge that we have facing us in terms of responses to pe people who use this kind of family violence. 
um, in that we have only just begun to recognise elder abuse as a form of family violence and, and sort of did so officially through the Royal Commission in the same way that we did with adolescent violence, which is a particular interest of mine and I think has many similar flavours and challenges to it. Um, we've done that, we've started talking about it in policy circles, um, we've started recognising it further and, and sort of talking about what we can do, but our broad response to family violence remains designed around intimate partner family violence. So in terms of interventions that are available, obviously there is the legal systems intervention and that Family Violence Protection Act uh, de defines family violence very broadly. So in theory encompasses a response um, that could address a various range of scenarios in, involving various ranges of um, family violence and different family relationships. But what happens after that in terms of the intervention programs that are available are still primarily designed around intimate pa partner family violence responses to men, so men's behaviour change programs. Um, Victoria has traditionally had the most significant number of funded men's behaviour change programs around Australia. So we you know, have been a leader in that regard for quite some time. Um, but they've still been held hostage to a certain level of policy ambivalence because the evidence about their effectiveness is still a little bit uh, vexed. Um, and because of that, traditionally government hasn't particularly wanted to fund them significantly because they sort of feel like, mm, we're not sure whether these actually do what we want them to do. So we don't know that we can invest that much. As a result, the programs haven't been able to respond in the way that they would like to, to respond to what is an incredibly difficult challenge. Um, but since the Royal Commission that's been recognised and funding has been increased and there's a lot um, growing capacity in that area resp to respond to the complexities of intimate partner family violence, but that's what those programs still are. They're very much, the curriculum is very much designed um, to respond along those lines. And then we've had in recent times, a few trials um, funded by the Department of Justice and the Department of and DHHS, which, are, which is looking at um, essentially piloting a different version for, you know, for different cohorts. Um, but the case that Rebecca has outlined is, is a really great example of how we don't have, our system is not equipped to respond um, in any, <laughs> in any of those scenarios that Rebecca has outlined, including um, we're not really responding to uh, we're not really equipped to respond to scenarios in which um, a woman is the perpetrator and where there are a range of different other co-occurring issues going on. Um, but I know that we're gonna address that a little bit later. Thanks, Eleanor. Rebecca, could I bring you back in on that question? So what's your view? Do you think there are enough um, programs available for perpetrators of elder abuse? And if you think about the legal system, are we using things like intervention orders in the right way to, to compel some of those options for perpetrators? So there are two big questions, Gerard. Um, I think that there are almost no programs for perpetrators of elder abuse. In the three years I've been at Senior's Rights, I'm not aware of any perpetrator participating in a program. So that's that's a worry, really. That that is something that needs to improve. In terms of some of the current justice responses, we find intervention orders very powerful in the area of getting an adult child out of a house. So we're able to help the older person go to court and get an exclusion order. The police then come around and the, the child's removed immediately. Uh, that is extremely powerful. People's lives improve you know, overnight when that happens. And generally there's not a contested intervention order hearing afterwards. Not everybody's prepared to do that. And it's not uncommon for us to have our clients say to us, you know, couldn't you just talk to my son and, and explain to him that his behaviour is not appropriate? Well, obviously, we can't do that. Um, 
but there is probably a proportion of cases where the parents would be willing to have the, the child continue to live in the house, perhaps with a limited intervention order on the condition that they did do some sort of um, counselling or course or some uh, program. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, like any good webinar, there's fantastic work that goes behind the scenes to make us look as good as possible. So we thank all the behind the scenes um, contributors. Now, one of those is Melody Yerston, who has been significantly involved in putting the whole webinar together and liaising with us behind the scenes. So from time to time, we're gonna call on you, Melanie. So um, if you could uh, make yourself live and um, see if there's a, a question that we could um, put to the panel now. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, thank you, Jared. There's been um, some really great questions. I'm going to um, sort of put two of them together. There's been a couple of comments about the impact of COVID and how older people have cancelled their regular in-home services and people wondering if this has meant more vulnerability and isolation. Um, and I'd also like to ask um, Tala's question where she um, asks, are there any specific trends or issues or challenges in gathering data regarding um, older people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds? So I thought, Bryony, you might be able to comment um, on some of the challenges of perhaps gathering data from, from those communities. And then Rebecca, you might like to comment on um, some of the increased isolation or circumstance that might have changed with um, family members moving back home during the pandemic. Shall I go first? Thanks, Melanie, for the question. Um, yeah, it, it is uh, certainly challenging uh, to collect data from people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And um, there are a number of reasons for that. And it's not just about language, it's about cultural uh, culture and cultural understandings of, uh, of things like elder abuse. Um, so um, again, to refer to the uh, prevalence study, there is a sub-study that uh, we contributed questions to that is actually gonna specifically target people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. So it'll be interesting to see the outcome of that. But um, as researchers, I guess what we find is we need to um, get to know those communities, get their trust. Uh, ideally, you get people who are from those communities going in and collecting data. Sometimes you have to approach the issues of consent differently because you'll get people who um, who come from countries where signing a, a formal document like a participant information and consent form has meant uh, a, a risk of abuse of in itself from government and government agencies um, so yeah there are a range of challenges um, and um, it'll be interesting to see, again, what, uh, what comes out of the prevalence study, how successful they've actually been in being able to target those groups. Thanks very much, Brian. And Rebecca? So I think my question was about COVID and <clears throat> the impacts of that. Sydney's Rights hasn't actually seen much of an increase in um, calls at this point. Calls have been steady. But we obviously know that adults are moving home with their parents. Uh, we also know that there's massive financial stresses. I think Megan's seen increased presentations of family violence, including elder abuse in hospitals. So all of those situations create unhappy opportunities for elder abuse to go undetected. What I suspect will happen is that there will be a wave of cases a bit further down the track. I mean, often older people when they're dealing with their own children, albeit adult children, they want to give them a chance. You know, they know that the kids are under financial stress. They've got all their own issues too. So it will be when it becomes unbearable that they start to make, make the call and look for support. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Eleanor, just back to yourself. We were having a bit of a conversation before that question about perpetrators. Um, if we think about perpetrators that have um, particular needs, say, for example, mental health needs or substance abuse or other forms of addiction, what, what type of supports do you think should be made available? Um, and do we need to look at more ways to compel that type of support to actually be taken up? 
It's a really interesting question, Jared, um, and is being sort of grappled with in the context of some of the recommendations from the Royal Commission in terms of, generally, in terms of perpetrators of intimate partner violence. Um, some of the recommendations from the Royal Commission looked at, you know, the I'd asked uh, courts to explore the option of civil orders which included people to being compelled to participate in AOD or mental health services, for example. It's a bit of a fraught issue because courts don't generally like to um, use a power which then creates a, the potential for criminal justice involvement down the track. So that's still being worked out and we actually contributed to some work last year which the court was going to be piloting this year um, before obviously COVID hit. But more generally, um, issues of mental health and AOD, gambling is, was um, nominated and that's a biggie that often goes under the radar. Um, but is in, interestingly is going to be, I think, an increasing issue. We know it's an increasing issue during COVID and I think it's going to be an increasing issue post COVID because of the economic uh, disadvantage that so many people will be experiencing. Um, so we do need services who can work with all of those issues and in the context of intimate partner violence, men's behaviour change programs are, do have increasing casework capacity to work with those co-occurring issues um, while doing so in a way that doesn't suggest or imply that, that they're the cause of the family violence. But what we also need are services working in collaboration where AOD, so if people present to an AOD service or a mental health service, um, but they are also using family violence, that's something that that workforce in that service is equipped to respond to, again, in a way that doesn't actually um, put all the, all the weight or responsibility for the use of violence onto that mental health issue or onto the AOD. Um, so it's a really complex question and it's something again that is being worked on in policy circles to develop the capacity of all services no matter where no matter the point at which somebody um, enters the service can be uh, responded to in a way that actually addresses any violence that they might be using but we're, again we're a long um, that we're a long way from getting there we're still just only at the beginning stages of that work thanks Elena. Rebecca, um, <clears throat> the report's fantastic in giving us a really good uh, historical insight into the impact of elder abuse on older people and all the different forms and types that it takes. If you get your crystal ball out, um, if we look forward, and what, um, what, have we got the right pathways and support systems in place now for older people? So as we go on from here, uh, any observations about the supports uh, that we need for older people? I think there are now quite a lot of supports for older people. Perhaps they don't necessarily realise that yet, so that needs to be publicised more. Uh, I, I do really think there needs to be a bit more of a focus on perpetrator responsibility. I'd also like to see a bit more of a preventative focus. So, for example, you know, one of the things in our wish list is that we work with Centrelink at some point around people who are wanting to enter into family arrangements or granny flat arrangements so that those people are getting some good advice to avoid elder abuse situations in the future. Uh, I think it's great that older people have the option of mediation. So there's quite a lot of money has gone into that, but I really would like uh, that to include perhaps some legal advice just so that people are mediating uh, from, a set, from a position of strength and they really know what their rights and options are. Thanks very much, Rebecca. I'm going to call on you, Megan, in just one minute to um, see if there's anything like that you'd like to add in terms of your crystal ball about um, the supports and the pathways for older people. But just before I do, a reminder to everybody that very shortly we're going to go to the, the questions. And so Melody is going to guide each of those questions for us. So if you haven't got your question in the Q&A box, so this is the time to now focus on that. Um, and after Megan, I'm just going to ask each of the panel members to make one closing comment. So when you look at the report, um, what, what's one what of the most um, significant takeaway comments that, that you might have? So 
Megan, back to yourself. Uh, in terms of the future and the sort of support that older people and the pathways for older people, any observations about that? Um, thanks, Jared. Um, these are probably more my personal views, not necessarily Peninsula Health's views, but I, st I still think um, in Victoria, we do have to have a better understanding of what older people do actually want and need. Um, I've certainly found in my experience that age itself can be a barrier in terms of the older person being age 65. So we might have services that might work with, um, be very comfortable to work in that family violence um, field where they might be supporting someone in an partner, intimate partner for a, a situation where they might be in their 60s and there's a perception when someone hits 65 or 70 um, it's as if they don't know what to do in that situation so um, I think there's more work we can do around that um, certainly in my experience you know the whenever I've been talking to older people or, or working directly in that clinical situation I think very rarely do older people within a health setting choose or consent um, a legal pathway for change. It, it, it often is around, as Rebecca was saying, it's often around, oh, can you just tell my son or my daughter to stop doing this? What, what else can you do to um, support them around the fact they haven't got a job and things like that? I suppose some of the things that I've observed in my health service, which I think is a positive and I think it's going to make a difference, is absolutely the introduction of MARAM um, for organisations next year in terms of early 20, 2021. And I think that's just from the learnings that I'm observing in our own health service. Obviously, we've got AOD and mental health already within scope within our health service. And, um, and obviously there are older people that um, intersect with the mental health services. And I think the fact that you've got such, a, such new legislation as the information sharing scheme really does enable, I suppose, services to work together to increase safety and well-being of both six, um, victim survivors um, and also perpetrators by removing some of those barriers and working together. So I, I do think and I'm, I'm confident that some of that new legislation will support improved pathways, reduce silos um, and allow um, organisations and hospitals to work with um, the, the key sector to support older people um, moving forward. So that's probably some of my reflections. Thanks very much, Megan. So Eleanor, over to you first. So um, a top of mind comment that for yourself about what, uh, what was one of the most important things that, that you drew from the report? Uh, well, just jumping back, Jared, I would echo Megan's comments because I think there's a huge um, promise and opportunity in terms of the information sharing, but also that Marum in terms of the whole of family risk assessment to understand the dynamics that may be um, occurring in all sorts of directions in a family scenario. And one of the things that I'm fascinated to think about um, because of the area in which I work is while we acknowledge that we have a one size fits all kind of legal response that in some in some cases intervention orders are the only things that can um, support people experiencing elder abuse although it's very very common um, for people to want that as a last resort but what i'm thinking about um, and is part of a project that i'm developing is actually what is the cons what is the interaction or intersection of that predominant legal response what impacts is that actually having on uh, older family members because um, when someone is removed from the home for perpetrating intimate partner violence, often the place that the, to which they go is their parents. Um, and take, so the, the behaviours that they have become accustomed to using um, and the consequent sort of unravelling of a life um, can often get displaced and with old parents bearing the brunt. So it's something that we're, I think, again, we also have to stop thinking about these, these types of family violence in, just in silos, just as we have to stop responding to them in silos, we also have to understand the links that may be occurring um, across that where different members of the family are experiencing harm um, that has simply been displaced from somewhere else. Thanks, Elena. Much appreciated. So a quick closing comment from everyone else. Bryony, over to you next. Thanks, Jared. I mean, I think that the gaps that I see coming out, particularly from this report, are perpetrator interventions, which we've talked quite a lot about, or supports or whatever's required. 
But also I think when we think about this in the context of the broader family violence uh, framework, there are a couple of gaps that we need to think about and that are, they are older men as victims where, you know, with um, elder abuse, we have a third in this study and I think that's fairly consistent across the world that we, you know, we have a significant number of older men and also women as perpetrators. So really thinking about um, how do we address what's behind that, what's causing that, are there, are there the same issues of, of um, uh, mental health and drug and alcohol and so on. Um, and if I can just have one further comment, I'd really like us to uh, focus on, on prevention. And there's very little, extremely little evidence so far. There's been very little research done on how to prevent um, elder abuse from occurring in the first place. The little evidence there is suggests that there's promise for intergenerational programs. So it'd be great to see more uh, focus on intergenerational activities and, uh, and also research into how they impact down the track on family thanks, relationships. Thanks, I'm trying to get to a few questions. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll ask for Megan and, and Rebecca just to give us one. So um, over to you, Rebecca. So for a small organisation like Seniors Rights, which is supposed to be a statewide service and finds it very hard to be that because it's so small. For me, the report's just amazing because it gives us some data that we can grab and then hopefully apply for grants to get funding to deal in areas that we know need support. Thanks very much, Rebecca. And Megan? Um, I just think from my perspective, again, it's probably the health the health experience coming through. I mean, it's huge congratulations. I mean, it's it's just it's such an incredible report to see that data there. But I think I'm I'm very mindful that the, the, this data does represent a population of older people who are more likely to be engaged, wanting to um, probably recognise what's happening to them is a form of abuse or violence, um, and are quite engaged to perhaps consider what the next steps are. So. There's a whole cohort of older people, I think, that we don't know what that looks like. And they're probably the people that end up in our hospitals who do have um, multiple medical issues, who do have um, cognitive issues, dementia, um, other, other factors. And it's sort of, you know, I, I think it's more around what, what, else, what else can we do to support that group of older people who aren't engaged um, in terms of ensuring that we're actually meeting their needs and respecting their choices and trying to support them through empowering them to live as independently as possible in their own homes and, and making them feel safe rather than removing. Because I think there's always such a quick fix to um, take all um, for that older person perhaps to leave their home or to consider residential care or to go to VCAT. But I think it's that, it's that other group of people who aren't engaged. Um, can we be doing more for them? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Megan. So to bring Melanie back in, Melanie, have you um, got a question you'd like to um, read to us from all our participants? I do. Um, this one is, it says from Anne, is there a study being done on the pressure or expectation from society being placed on older people to support their children and or grandchildren, whether financially returning home or child mining um, and the abuse this may lead to? For example, working all their lives and then being expected to leave their savings to their children and not being able to enjoy their retirement money. I thought this was an interesting question that some of the panelists might like to comment on as to we've spoken a lot about um, personal situations, but are there wider societal expectations that are also leading into some of this abusive behaviour? Bryony, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a short answer. Um, um, I mean, there are lots of uh, societal pressures that most of which you've talked about, um, but certainly I think there's um, a risk in kind of uh, intergenerational conflict narrative that goes around that, and, and that's we're hearing that at the moment a bit, that, um, that we are all, that young people are suffering economically to protect older people from COVID-19. So, you know, there's kind of that builds a resentment that older people are hanging on to assets and privileges and so on that, are, um, you know, to, at the expense of, of younger people. Um, 
I think there is more pressure to be to be carers to look after grandchildren, um, and that's that's a trend that's been happening over a long time as as women return to the workforce, and of course there is that well-known phenomenon of inheritance in patients, so a sense of entitlement that what your parents' assets and money, they're going to leave it to you anyway, so <clears throat> you might as well have it now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I've got another question here um, that, Eleanor, you might be well placed to answer. Um, it's in terms of perpetrator participation, and you could answer this in terms of intimate partner violence or elder abuse, and as we discussed, there's not many elder abuse programs. Um, but in terms of perpetrator participation, what are some of the barriers um, around people participating and having them involved and actually um, completing, say, a men's behaviour change program? And what is the objectively perfect scenario for dealing with perpetrators? Um, I don't know if you want to at all um, also mention anything about differences between perpetrator responsibility and accountability. Um, so that's all, an answer to that question is a webinar in itself, I think, but um, the, the barriers are enormous because um, perhaps going to the ideal scenario, you'd probably, it helps us reflect on how difficult that is to um, achieve. An ideal scenario involves, um, first of all, somebody feeling some sort of investment in participating in an in intervention that changes their, or changing their behaviour. Some sort of insight and some sort of reason for wanting to um, move to a different place and preserve their family relationships and keep their family safe. But the barriers that are up, that um, present themselves are often incredibly significant, uh, particularly you know, in the immediate term where people are removed from the home, they're experiencing homelessness, um, Often they're, you know, sleeping in their car when they they've been sleeping in their car for three days before uh, after an exclusion order, and then they're brought to court. Um, they spent the, t the time in their car googling men's rights movements and getting all and getting very overly um, kind of triggered by all of those narratives. Uh, they may be experiencing AOD, mental health, gambling, all the co-occurring issues that we've been talking about. Um, but there's also a bit of a um, tension or a challenge where that ideal that somebody is invested in changing their behaviour or um, shifting the way in which they interact with their family comes up against the sense that the system um, of legal interventions has imposed a consequence on them, um, which can sometimes mean that that sort of actually increases that idea in their head that they're, they're actually the victim. And in an intimate partner sense, um, victim narratives in intimate partner violence are incredibly powerful. And one of the things that um, prevents or perpetuates that. And then when we play into that, that sense of, when we're talking about elder, elder abuse and that sense of entitlement and or, oh, well, I've been wronged because they should have helped me and they should have supported me and oh, I should have, um, got access to my inheritance, whatever it is, um, then the system comes down and imposes a consequence in not a very nuanced way, not because we're churning people through the system like you wouldn't believe. Um, there's not many opportunities for meaningful conversations or, or a sequencing of interventions which actually kind of scaffold people through the steps of getting to a different place. So sometimes what we're doing with the best of intentions and we have to do it to keep people safe can, can clash with our ideal that we want people to realise themselves that they need to change. Thank you. I think we've got time for one last question. And there was an interesting one. Let me just find it um, from Catherine um, saying, great work as a mental health clinician working with older people in a community mental health service. What key indicators should I be alert to in the very various areas of aged abuse? So I was wondering, um, perhaps Megan, you might be able to answer this or Rebecca about what are some of the things that um, people who work with older people might look out for um, and be aware of? Megan, let me call on you. 
All right, I thought Rebecca was going to answer. Just so in terms, um, I mean, I can only speak just from um, my experience here within our health service and obviously the we have a program here that's funded. So we have a specialist family violence um, advisor supporting mental health clinicians. And certainly from um, the data that I've seen um, in terms of the indicators, um, I think it'd be true to say that some of the risk factors that we know about older people and elder abuse are very prevalent um, in that cohort but probably some of the, the risk factors that we're also aware of in terms of the perpetrators, um, in terms of having all those factors that we know in terms of um, significant behavioural issues, gambling issues, all those financial stresses. Um, I think certainly that the data I've seen within our health service, and we've touched on this today, I, it, it's really important within the mental health lens too, that we take this lifespan approach. And we certainly have, there are many situations or, or families that we work with in our region where we are working with families where there is um, vulnerable children, children at risk, adults and, and older people all within that intergenerational family unit. So, um, but you know, whoever that has asked that question, I think um, it would be really important to find out what's happening in their local region. There are mental health specialist advisors. Um, we do have um, many of the health services have got training specifically around elder abuse, family violence, that do have a mental health lens. Um, and obviously there's the IMOC too. So there's, there's plenty of opportunities for anyone to reach out um, in particular fields and get some more educational information or training in that space. So I probably can't answer, <laughs> it's, it's probably with the time, I'm just aware of the time frame. So that's a very quick answer. Thanks very much, Megan. So just before I hand back to, to Jenny Bakey to close the webinar today, I'd just like to make an observation um, as Commissioner and Ambassador for Elder Abuse Prevention, and that's with you know, the great work of SRV. This, is, this report really heralds that every one of those numbers is a person. Every one of those numbers is a person, and they wouldn't have received the support that they would have desperately needed without um, the work of so many and the leadership of SRV and CODA. And I'm reminded when I look at the number of participants that are still with us, so many people who are passionate about providing the best support to older people that they can in what are challenging times. So, yeah, coming from me, thanking all of you for your continued interest in protecting older people as best we can. Back to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, um, Jared. And I'd like to thank you for your generosity with your time and sharing the panel today and doing it so well. And I particularly want to thank um, the panellists too, uh, Rebecca, Bryony, Megan and Eleanor. Um, I think that's been such a great um, session. I've really got a lot out of it. I've learnt a lot and I think it's really expanded my thinking and I'm hoping that the attendees have got the same view. I think it was a really high quality. So I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. Great questions. So really, again, really pleased at the questions and what people are thinking about and what they're asking. It's really great involvement. So I'm um, just to finish off with the, the thank yous and I'd like to thank Nari for being such a great partner for, for us and um, being so interested in this issue and working with us on our research projects. I'd like to thank the writers and researchers who produced the report. So Melanie Yostin from Sydney's Lice Victoria and then from Nari Pragya Gatula and Peter Feldman and Bianca Pujna and Bryony Down. Um, it's been great. And then the advisory group that we had for the project, which had Rachel Carson from the Australian Institute of Family Studies and John Chestman from the Office of Public Advocate. And Gina Fisk and Dot Campbell, who are Sydney's Rights Victoria peer educators who are great skilled and um, great contributors. And Paul Yates from Austin Health and David White from Elder Rights Advocacy. And for organising this event, I would like to thank Melanie Yostin for all her work and, and Philip Money and Rebecca Matthews from NARI for uh, putting it all together and organising the media. But finally, I want to thank particularly you who have agreed and put your time aside to participate in this event. We've had a fantastic response and really appreciate your interest and know that there's a great team of people who are wanting to tackle this issue. So thank you very much. And I um, commend the report to you. It's on our website as well as a summary. And we'll be sending answers out to your questions that we didn't get to. So um, we'll still be engaging with you in some way. And with that, I close proceedings. Thank you.